it might do. Let's take a better folder. <laughs> we can do that. Uh, we'll be in Romans 7. Uh, so Romans 7 is on page whatever. Um, perfect. Romans 7. So over the last few weeks, we've been going through Romans. Uh, Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8 are kind of one thought. Um, and so today, as we go through um, as we go through 7, we're going to see it build off of 6, and then prepare us next week for chapter 8. So I'm going to read this, what it says here. Uh, many Christians take a lot of comfort in Romans chapter 7. In this chapter, Paul famously discusses the struggle of the Christian life. How can a person be saved, a slave to sin, and a slave to righteousness, and yet still do wrong? How can one be a Christian and still sin against God? Um, Paul discusses at length, as well as gives examples from his own personal struggle. And so we'll take a look at this towards the end of chapter 7. But before we get there, we're going to look at Paul's example of marriage for the relationship of the Christian church with Christ. Uh, the example of a wedding, a marriage, a wedding feast, etc. is used many times in the New Testament, especially by Jesus himself. Um, marriage is a miraculous thing, and Christ likes to use it to describe our relationship with him. So the last time we met, we looked at Romans chapter 6, how we were dead to sin and alive to Christ. Uh, we saw how death no longer has authority over us because our sin was crucified with Christ. Now that we belong to and we serve Jesus. The Roman ends with chapter 6 and it ends with verse 23. Let's read it again. And this passage will serve as a great transition into today's lesson. Yep, verse 23. Yeah, that'd be great. Great. Um, so we have that. The wages of sin is death. And then we have the gift of Christ Jesus. Now let's read. I'll read this next part. Verses 1 to 6 of chapter 7, building off of that. Um, or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know, the pr who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by the law to her husband while he lives. And if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were still living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. All right, we have a text message from the Internet. Let's see what it says here. Well, can you hear it now? Um, hopefully the sound's coming through now. Um, let me know. Send me another message. Okay, so in verse 1, let's see what it says now. Sorry. I'm going to try and get everybody video chatted here. It's a little better, but still too quiet. Well, let's see what's going on here. I think it's this one. We'll try that. See if that makes it a little easier for the folks at home. Okay, so in verse 1, Paul talks about the law's authority. Uh, what law is he talking about? Um, so he says here, um, For I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. What law? What law is he talking about? 
Is it the Old Covenant Law? That's the Mosaic Law. So that's all of the 613 commandments in the Old Testament. Is it just the Ten Commandments? Is the law written on our hearts? Or is it something else? Yeah, he's definitely, he's definitely is. Um, he's also speaking in, in broader terms, just in general, any law. So we have laws um, in Minnesota. I'm pretty sure we have laws here. Yeah. Yep, yep, very specific. Like every, every state's got their own like unique weird laws. Like in, uh, in New York State, it's illegal to leave your elephant tied to a street sign. Um, in, in, Flor yeah, in Florida, they have laws about when you can and cannot walk your alligators. Like there's just different laws for different places but any law is only binding if you're alive I mean, that's a, a very obvious statement I guess that when you're dead you don't have to worry about tying your elephant to a flagpole or, or whatever it is um, and so he says it says that here like for the, the next step then he uses the example of marriage so in verse 2 or the next page in our handout then in verses 2 and 3 Paul gives this example of marriage how one person is only bound to your spouse as long as the other is alive right and so you're only married as long as both of you are living. That's just how it works out. Um, then how is that applied to the Christian then in verse 4? Right, so he says in, verse, in verses 2 and 3 that if you're married to your spouse when you're alive, that's fine. Um, and if your spouse dies, you're free to marry somebody else. But if your spouse is alive and you want to marry somebody else at the same time, then we have problems. But what's he say here in verse 4? Yeah, there is some of that going on. Um, but he's taking it even a step further. He's saying that all laws, not just laws of the land, um, that we died to them. And so in the same way that we wouldn't be married to somebody who's died, we're not attached to those old laws. Um, but he's talking specifically about sinfulness. Um, so like the law, sh one of its purposes is to show us our sin. And if we're no longer with the law, because that's, we died to that law, then those we died to those sins too. They're not attached to us anymore. They're attached, attached to Christ. They're not attached to us now. And so our sins aren't attached to us because we died to sin. In the same way a spouse isn't attached to a spouse once that spouse dies. Um, is what he's getting. Then he's going to take it a step further in verses 5 and 6. This is what he says. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. And so he's talking about here, uh, before we had Christ, we were married to sin, and our, our actions were sinful, doing sinful things. But because we died, or having been released from the law, having died to it, we are now attached to Christ to serve the new way of the Spirit, um, not the old way of the written code. And so now... Now we have our righteousness not through doing good things, through keeping the, keeping the Ten Commandments or whatever, but through um, through this way of the Spirit, through God. Um, and we would call that fancy way then, the fancy word is sanctification. Um, that the Spirit dwells in us and helps us to, to live good lives, not because of the old law, but because we're attached to Christ. If that makes sense. Perfect. Great. Hopefully it makes sense to you guys online too. Okay. Um, let's go on then. So let's read verses, this next paragraph here, uh, verses 7 to 12. Um, sure, sounds good. What then shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means, that if sin had not reigned in the law, I would not have been a sin, for I would not have been doing what it is to covet, if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seeing an opportunity through the commandment, Sin 
Great. Thank you. So why is Paul asking the question then, is the law sin? Right? So he starts out the, the first, first verse 7 here. Should we say that the law is sin? Well, why is he asking that? What's, his, what's he getting at? Yeah, yep, certainly. Um, he's also trying to to make sure he d we don't we don't think wrong about the previous section, right? This this marriage of marrying to married to sin and married to Christ, um, that language, uh, because it could be it could be considered then that before before Jesus took our sins, that we were married to the law, right? And so then the law then would be the source of our sinfulness. And that's not what he's saying. He wants us to say, no, 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 no. The law is not sinful. The law is good. It's perfect. It's just. Uh, but it shows us our sins, and we have to make that distinction. The law is perfect, and, and, and we're not. Um, as he then he goes, says here, you know, the rest of verse 7, I wouldn't have known what coveting is had somebody said, don't covet, right? And so the law shows us that, yeah. Um, and so the next question I have here is, how does sin seize the law? Well, sin... Um, uses what's good and it takes it to make something bad um, and so as soon as we hear don't covet we start thinking about coveting or don't steal what could I steal or you know don't swear what words can I get away with kind of thing um, and so sin seizes the law and it tries to get us to break it because now it has a target before we just kind of sinned in general but once we know what the rules are then we can specifically target the rules and our sinful nature wants to break them and starts attacking the rules themselves. Yeah. Um, so then in verse 8, Paul, Paul says this. He says, um, For apart from the law, sin lies dead. What do you think he means? I'm sorry you have to answer all the questions. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, there's there's an element of that. Um, there's there's two ways I've heard this passage talked about. Uh, the first one is that God doesn't hold people accountable to sins if they've never heard the law. Um, I disagree with that. I don't think that's the right way to think about it. And so that 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 answer seeks to to handle the question. Well, what about people who've never heard of Jesus? Are they still condemned? And some would point to this vo to this verse and say, well. God doesn't count sins if you've never heard about the law because God's fair and that's a fair thing to do. I don't think that's what this passage is saying. I think what it's saying is um, is our, our sins lie lie dead before we have the law in that they don't have to do any work. We're just sinning without knowing it. Whereas our sins are, sins are alive and active when they have a specific target. You know, when he says, I didn't know what I was coveting until the law said don't covet. Um, so now it's got, like I said, that specific attack on that commandment to sin. And so my sins now are now more active trying to get me to, to break God's commandments when before it was just doing what it wanted and there was no, no pushback against it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so before I didn't have a fight going on inside of me and now I have a fight going on inside of me. Because before you know right and wrong, you just kind of do whatever. There's no conflict in your conscience. But once you know what's right and wrong, now there's this inner conflict between do I do what's right or do I give in to temptation and into sin. Yeah.
that is a really good question. Um, sorry, camera's acting up again. So, an important question that we have to ask is: is how are how are people saved, right? And salvation isn't accomplished by our our works. Condemnation happens by works. So what, what does a person contribute to salvation? Well, the need to be saved is how it goes. And so we know that our works can condemn us, but they can't, they can't save us. Um, and so for a person who's, who, is, um, who hasn't heard and who doesn't know that they're doing the wrong thing, well, they're still doing the wrong thing, and their works still condemn them. Um, they're not saved by not knowing about the wrong thing. Uh, what saves is Jesus alone. Um, as he very clearly states in, in, in John's Gospel, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, and so then we, we know we have these, these two, I want to say, it. it's, it's, it's a paradox that we have to, that we have to wrestle with. Um, what do we know about people who, don't, who don't, haven't heard about Jesus? Well, what, what about them? Well, we know on the one hand that Everybody's sinful. Um, we've already talked about in Romans, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Right? That was just the, the last verse that we read. The wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So if people are still dying. That means that they're still sinful. Um, but we also know that salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Um, and so the, then what about those who've never had the opportunity to hear Jesus? Well, the Bible gives us a couple of things. One, go tell them, right? And that's the mission of the church. We're, we're the, yep, go and teach everyone. Um, be the feet that carries the mouths that proclaim the gospel. Like go, go and tell people. And so we do that. And then we trust that God's got something in plan that's fair, right? We don't know what it is. Um, but just because we don't know what it is doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, God has, has made very clear that he wants everybody to be saved. Um, in Ezekiel, he specifically says, I want everybody to be saved. I don't rejoice in the death of the wicked. I want everyone to be saved. Um, and so then God has a plan that he's happy with, that when we find out about, when we get to heaven, we're like, oh, yeah, that was really clever of you, God. He's like, I know. It's, it's what I was doing the whole time. Um, and we'll be happy with it. And so we don't know what it is. We trust that, that God does. I think she just drove up. Uh, why don't you go up by the door? She'll be in soon. We don't have any snacks today. I'm sorry. Maybe next week, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yep. Paul specifically talks about them. Um, no, no, it's fine. Um, uh, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, there's a couple of passages here where he where he he talks about this. Where he says back in back in chapter six, um, he says this. So what then? Are are we to sin? Because we're no longer under the law, but under grace? No. <laughs> uh, very specifically. So verse chapter 6, verse 15, uh, he says, Now what then? Are we to sin because we're not under law, but under grace? So like, okay, so I can do what I want now because I'm, that I'm dead to sin and alive to God? No, 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 no. Don't you know that if you present yourselves as, as to anyone as obedient slaves, your slaves are the one that you obey, either of sin which leads to death or obedience which leads to righteousness. So just because you say to yourself um, that this is that you that you can keep on sinning doesn't mean you can keep on sinning, right? It, it shows, um, yeah. What's what I'm looking for? Speaking in those terms that I can do whatever I want because God will forgive me anyway um, shows a a spiritually young understanding of Christianity um, because you're starting to wrestle with the true nature of grace and you recognize that God will forgive every sin. That's what God has promised to do. Um, and so the person who would say something like that is, is spiritually immature. Um, and so 
Uh, I think it's Peter who uses the language of spiritual milk versus spiritual potatoes. This is a spiritual milk kind of question. And then the answer would be, well, no, right? It, God's forgiveness isn't licensed to go and, and sin more. Um, yeah, so that, that's, how, that's how I'd interact with that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so then our, our response as, as more mature Christians would be to say, is it though? Is, is, is that what God wants? You, th you think God's happy in heaven, like looking down at you and saying, yep, that's exactly what I want. No, of course not. That's not how it works. And so you know, because God has done so much for us, we want to do what God wants us to do. Not because, you know, we have to, okay, we're saved by grace, but because why wouldn't we? God's done so much. It'd be a joyful response. Yeah. Um, in fancy theological words, that's the third use of the law. Um, I want to write it down. Because I have a board, I have to write something down. Right? Right. Uh, so that the law has three uses. Three uses. The first is a curb. I like to call it a sword. Right, this is the, I'm going to prevent you from doing something dumb. So like, if you rob a bank, you're going to go to jail. Like there's a, there is a sword, a punishment to in place to keep you from doing something wrong. Um, the second is a mirror, which is what most of Romans talks about. Uh, this shows your sin. And we just talked about this. This is where Paul's like, I didn't know what coveting was until I looked in the mirror and it said, oh, you're, a coven you're coveting, right? That's, that's what this one is. And the third one is a guide or a map. People don't use maps anymore. I'm going to write GPS. <laughs> GPS. Um, right. And the third is the law is, I'm a Christian, now what? Right, so this is this is the now what question. Now what? So now that I'm saved, now that I have faith, now that I have grace, I have salvation, I'm married to to Christ instead of to sin, what do I do? And that's the third use of the law, where we look at the law and it gives us it gives us this this is how I live my life. You guys can't see that online. Let me make that bigger. Um, so you can see all my fancy writing here. Um, yeah, so the, the three uses of the law, curb, mirror, and guide, that's how I learned them, or sword, mirror, and GPS, whatever you want to say. Um, and so people who are asking those questions, like, okay, so uh, I'm going to be safe, but I can do whatever I want, that's where we point to the law. And they say, no, 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 no. God has expectations for how Christians live their lives. doesn't save you, but you still get to do them. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay, um, where are we? I think we're reading verses 13 now. 13 to... Uh, well, let's just read into, Let's just read 13 to 20. We'll do that. 13 to 20. I'll read it. Um, Did that which is good, then, bring death to me? By no means. It was sin, producing death in me, through what is good, in order that sin might be known to be sin, and that the commandment might become sinful... Um, through the commandment, might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not want, that is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Okay. So what's the purpose of the law as stated in verse 13? What's the law do? We talked about it. Shows our sin. Yes, it's basically saying that, that, that 
right? Right, so the, yeah, it says specifically in order that sin might be shown to be sin, right? That's what it does. The law shows us our, our sins. Um, verse 14 causes a lot of controversy among Christians. Uh, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. Why do you think this would cause controversy? Um, yeah. What does it mean by being spiritual of the flesh? Isn't it not both? Isn't Paul, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, wouldn't he be a spiritual person, do we think? And he's an apostle. He's he is an apostle. He wrote the he wrote the Bible, right? This is, yeah. What's going on here? Right. And so there is a lot of controversy with this because Paul here is showing that even even an apostle, like the apostle Paul, who wrote half of the New Testament. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, but that's not what he's getting at. He's getting at here that even as a super Christian, as we would say, a saint, you know, in the in the the Catholic sense of the word, he's still a sinner. That even the Apostle Paul, you know, like I said, who wrote half the Bible, still sinned and still struggled with sin, and that causes controversy because there are Christians, branches of Christianity that teach that you can stop sinning. And Paul here's like, no, <laughs> I struggle with sin. And if I struggle with sin, and I'm the Apostle Paul, you're struggling with sin too. He's just saying, he's just saying, don't put me on a pedestal. I'm, I'm not any better than you guys are, right? I work as God wants me to work. Um, and so don't look at me and say, oh yeah, one day I can become as faithful as the Apostle Paul and I'll stop sinning. No. That's that's not how it works, and so we don't want to get puffed up with um, pride. pride that I, I've stopped sinning. Well, no, you haven't stopped sinning. The apostle Paul didn't stop sinning. You haven't stopped sinning either. Is is what he's getting at here, and then he goes through um, and he starts unpacking this struggle of a Christian. Um, if you want to sound smart, you say it in Latin, and and Lutherans use the word simul. S I M U L, Eustace. Four words. Et peccator. That is all the Latin I know. And so simul, that's simultaneous. You add the rest of the English letters onto it. At the same time, Eustace, you put a J in front of it, justified or saint. And sinner. So at the same time, we are justified and unrighteous. Saint and sinner um, that we struggle with. And so Paul here, the Apostle Paul, is going to go through and, and describe what it means to be at the same time a saint and a sinner. And just talks about what the, the, the Christian struggle is like. I'm going to read it again. I'm going to read... From verse 15 all the way to the end of the chapter. Um, this is one. This is what it's like down to earth being a Christian. That's what he says. For I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree the law is good. So now it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. So I found it to be a law then, that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of, of sin. And so he just goes through and unpacks the daily struggle of, of every Christian. Simul uses et peccator. Um, and Lutherans just kind of shorten it down to the simul because it's a lot less Latin to speak. Um, now we are at the same time justified, we have salvation, but we still sin every day. Um, yeah. And so this passage here is one of the most, I don't know, comforting passages in the Bible, these short verses here, where the Apostle Paul talks about that even that in our daily life of sin, we can still see our marriage to Christ, right? And so he separates, he separates his sinful nature from his s redeemed nature. And he calls it a war inside his person, that his body, his flesh, flesh and bones are still corrupted, still sin. But his, his person, himself, is still redeemed and lives with Jesus. And so he's going to have this constant battle inside of him. This, he calls it a war, the war of his body against his mind, um, of his sinful nature against his salvation, trying to live out life. I'm trying to do what's right, but always having to fight. Verse 21, when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. So he's always, always fighting this. And then what do you do? He even asks the question, Wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death? I'm still doing sins. I deserve death. Who can save me? Thanks be to God we have Jesus Christ our Lord. Um, so then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. All right. Yeah. No, that's the uh, I love to sin, God loves to forgive mentality. Yeah. No. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's our sinful nature. And so then Paul equates that to our, our flesh, like our, um, our actual physicalness of being a person. Um, when we talk about when when I talk about uh, about the the goal of Christianity, like the goal of Christianity is that we get the new heaven and the new earth. Like heaven is really nice, it's it's paradise, but it gets better, right? Um, our goal is what God has promised us is literally better than heaven, which I absolutely love to talk about. Um, and one of the hallmarks of that is we're going to get a new body, a new a new flesh. That's not sinful, right? We talk about it in the Apostles' Creed and the resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come. We're going to have flesh and bones and then stuff. Uh, we're not just going to be some kind of like Casper the Friendly Ghost spooking around in the clouds. No, we're going to have, there's going to be substance to us. Um, but the joy of the new creation is that substance is going to be perfect. Um, which means that right now, it's not. Right? More than just aches and pains. Um, there was this, there's this prevailing idea in the world that people are generally good who do bad things, right? And that's not a biblical way of talking about it. Um, we would say we are by nature sinful and unclean, that our very stuff, our, our nature is corrupted. And so it's not that we're good people who do bad things, we're bad people who by the grace of Jesus are able to do good things. Our default state isn't good. Our default state is bad. And so a way to look at it is what's easier to do, the wrong thing or the right thing? It's always easier to do the wrong thing. We have to, to work, to fight, to do the right thing, which is what Romans 7 is talking about. Right? I didn't know what was good until I heard the law, because I was just always doing bad things. And then when I learned what was law, now there's this war inside me where I gotta fight to do what's good. Um, and this is the struggle of the Christian. This is the, the symbol, the symbol uses et peccator, um, that we are now having this, this war within us. And who saves us from it is Jesus. Thanks be to God for Jesus. 
uh, that he came, that he lived and died and rose again to save us from this. And now we have this promise of not going to have a sinful flesh anymore. And we're going to get to live with God in, in perfection. Yeah. Great. Welcome. Any thoughts, comments, concerns? We covered all the questions just without going through them one by one. We're done now. Um, that's all of chapter 7. That's all I have to say. We could talk about it for more. I mean, I love I love Romans 7. Um, but, yeah. Romans 7 is one of the best chapters in the Bible. Just such good stuff. Second Corinthians 15 and Isaiah 40 to 45. Good stuff. I should make a list of the best parts of the Bible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of That's a hallway. <laughs> the vomitorium is a hallway at an, at an arena. And the reason why it's called the vomitorium, not because people threw up in it, but because people were spewed out of the arena as they were leaving. It was just the emergency exit for everybody to get out. Uh, so not to worry about that. There were, there, were, there, there were places where people vomited in ancient Rome, but they weren't the vomitoriums. That's just the big... Like when you you go to U.S. Bank Stadium, they have all these ramps for you to walk down or whatever to get out in the parking lot. That's the vomitorium. That's how you get out because uh, the insides are becoming the outsides of the stadium. So not as gross as it sounds. It still sounds pretty gross, though. <laughs> okay. This is a great passage for evangelism, um, specifically to Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. Specifically them, but other branches, even even Christian denominations. Um, but to these these cults, um, they don't have hope, right? Uh, places that are entirely based on works. So in Mormonism. You got to follow all the right steps, and Jehovah's Witnesses, you got to follow all the right steps, and you can very easily point out you didn't follow all the right steps, and so they just keep trying to do more and more and more and more and good. A passage like this can be very comforting, saying you're not going to do the right steps, but Jesus is going to forgive you. It's a wonderful thing to hear. Yeah. Yeah, the temple's gone. They can't sacrifice. It makes a makes a problem. Yep, it's true. Which is the good news of Jesus is that salvation's not about works. Salvation's about faith. If you want to say it's about works, you can say it's about the works of Jesus, and that counts. He did all the works for us, but we're saved, as he said here in chapter seven, by this this marriage. We're no longer married to sin. You know that spouse of ours died. We're now married to Christ. And he lives forever. So because Christ lives, we're going to live too. Great. All right. That's all I have for today. We'll finish a few minutes early. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we give you as much praise and thanksgiving as we can for sending Jesus to save us.
Lord, we're so grateful that our salvation isn't because we do things, but because Jesus did it all for us. Lord, help us to live in this truth, to live in the truth of our salvation, that we might share the goodness of Christ and proclaim his gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.